Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Adroit Journal's first ever online release reading. Um, this is a super exciting thing for us, and it's kind of a thing. While we while we've been doing it, we were kind of saying to ourselves, "Why haven't we been doing this for a while?" Um, just the whole experience of really communicating with the contributors, organizing something that's really like a tangible landmark to uh, this issue that we've just put out into the world this morning. Um, it was a really cool experience, and I think obviously this is going to be an even cooler experience. Um, you know, getting to hear directly from some of our uh, many of our marvelous uh, contributors that we have in this issue. So, um, so I'm really excited, and I assume many of the 200 plus of you and growing are also very excited. So, um, so thank you, first of all. Uh, thank you to our staff for making this issue happen. Thank you to our contributors for. Uh, for being willing to share your work and your uh, stories with us. And uh, thank you to all of you for reading, for enjoying, for uh, tuning in. Those of you who um, who sent in suggested donations, thank you. Um, we raised just about $2,000 for Artists Relief, which um, is definitely going to mean a lot to, uh, to a lot of people. Um, that that organization um, benefits. Um, so basically, uh, just like a really quick background on that organization. Uh, they are, um, they support artists that are facing financial troubles based uh, on COVID-19 and, uh, and this, the evolving situation here in the US. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we're really excited about the impact that, uh, that, you know, all of those very kind donations are going to have. And uh, we're also excited about this amazing reading that we get to have along the way. Um, so just to go over a couple of house rules, um, it'd be great, as I said, uh, but now more people are here, so I'll say it again. Uh, it'd be great if, if you're not reading, you could uh, be on mute. Feel free to add your camera. We love that. We love some smiling faces, but um, but we don't love really loud feedback or audio issues at all. So uh, let's just nip that in the bud um, and, uh, and, and that would be great. So, uh, so that is number one. And number two is uh, we would love, I've, I've been tweeting and retweeting and liking all day. Um, we would love to hear from all of you. Uh, if you wanna share a, a piece, a quote, uh, whatever it is uh, that re really resonated with you, feel free to just tag us. We'll show we'll show it some love on Twitter um, and I guess anywhere else. <laughs> uh, so so that's great. Um, we're at Adroit Journal on on Twitter. It's pretty logical, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then all of our uh, all of our readers. If you if you all as you um, join and and start to uh, start to read, want to share your uh, Twitter handle, if you have one, um, go for it. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we hope, we hope that you'll uh, participate in that conversation and, um, and be a part of this event that way, uh, as we, as the event gets underway. Um, and just so, just the last thing before we get going is, uh, sharing the reading list. So, uh, today we are going to hear from Josh Charles, uh, Jordan Jays, Yeli Kamara, David Naiman, Amy Nezhuku Madatil, Alicia Ostriker, and Diane Seuss uh, in that order. So uh, with that, um, Heidi, do you know, is Joss, Joss made it, right? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, great. I'm here. Welcome, Joss. So, um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joss Charles. So. Josh Charles is author of Field, a National Book Award longlisted finalist and winner of the 2017 National Poetry Series, selected by Fadi Judah uh, for Milkweed Editions, and also Safe Space, um, published from Asada Press. Charles has published poetry with Poetry, Poem a Day, Penn, Washington Square Review, Denver Quarterly, Action Yes, The Feminist Wire, and Elsewhere. Charles's writing has been featured on Bitch Media, Entropy, GLAD, Lambda Literary, and elsewhere. In 2016, she received the Ruth Lillian Darby 
Sergeant Rosenberg Fellowship through the Poetry Foundation. In 2015, she received the Monique Wittig Writers Scholarship. Joss Charles has an MFA from the University of Arizona and from 2000 to 2013 to 2018, she served as the founding editor for Them Lit, a trans literary journal. She is a PhD student at UC Irvine currently and resides in Long Beach, California. Uh, Joss, we're thrilled to have you and uh, I'm so excited to hear what you're gonna share tonight. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay and everything? I wanna make sure audio, video, it's okay, cool. Um, well, thank you uh, to, to everyone involved in organizing this, to Adroit for um, accepting the work and for organizing this, uh, to all the readers who are going to come after me. I'm so excited to hear you read. It's great. I'm honored to be included among you. And of course, to everyone who showed up. Uh, yeah, 232 and counting. Okay. I'm going to read... Uh, one of the poems uh, included, and then I'll read some other work from uh, the same manuscript that they're all, in my mind, a part of, um, and then I'll close with the other. A note on form. Never having lived among things, but Beside forms of things, I no longer look where the city lifts a little further past houses, oceans, light from a crane, breathing, no longer looking the child hurried beside a mother moving too, too fast at what escapes the grasp of leaves and awnings of leaves past what is lifted up, whatever word lifted from whatever through its lodge there being only one throat between us, past perception, anything but arrangement, and nevertheless perceiving as we must what moves between us, quickening no longer a roof, but atmosphere, precursor and remnant of speech, remaining as it must, perhaps the least effective of our music. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems from a sonnet cycle, um, tentatively called a night cycle, um, just a, a little night cycle. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read five, six, seven, eight, um, and I'm not going to read the others, it's longer. Um, and it's an elegy. Um, I guess I was. Uh, on a certain trajectory of the sonnet cycle that privileged light, love, happiness, knowledge. Mm. But there are kinds of address that are not that. Or should they be? A night cycle. Uh, five. I also wrote this, I guess I should say, um, after a a uh, dear friend of mine who passed. So this is for JC. Why should there be burning beneath the sun? Why should we have walked among Arnica, the rich hill roads behind where we grew? Should there have been homes where such figures stood alit the dark windows of night. Why should we have likened it to a curtain beneath which silhouetted greater bodies move? People have been staying home lately, those with places to stay. They've taken down or put up such displays. I saw a neighbor maintain a Judith statuette the same day the lizards came back. The sun has been really very bright since. The waves loud in the hollows of sea caves. Six. In masked at the gate, jar of eucalyptus, 
jar of sunflower. It is never too early to start planning the grounds for his card. I had kept for years my eyes fixed to floors, trembling, look up, you'd said, and when I did, leaves, window frames, whole air conditioning units in them. Beside a birchling, bending, yes, he says, found it, a patch of yellow, not yet marked with name. The sun fell low, so the hour had something to name. Seven. Into the book of leaves, I wrote, why is it when I sing, you hear? Into the endless book full of leaves, I mouth what I no longer hear. Long ago is what is with us still. Two books recording the others that closed, or like a jar, a lid on top of it. Because sound gains enclosure, I said, I will no longer sing. I said, I will strike each lid of each jar through each room I am most welcome in. I will strike my own jar loudest within my room because sound is buried in the object that loosed it, an alarm, air struck loose in the air. And this will be the last of the cycle. Eight. There is another place. It bends, nears the possible, while we, less than sleepers, busy ourselves with designs, fashion, and show. You have seen it, the endless billboards, canvas stretched across the face. Lovers who speak termless there, where lover is not a military term, where door touches frame and no one longs for a sovereignty they cannot obtain, where nothing is left undone, not even the ash poets will praise. There is another place, and there is ours. A night, these might be the same. Thank you again to everyone. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the last one that's included in this issue. Um, and just looking forward to a great night. A note on form. No, they say, at least today, filled with scents. The pocket of city planted shrubs lining the street, like a mind, not built, they say, but given. Concrete, the road, the paint bucket in the arm of a man spilling dashed lines to a road. It is sense he makes, and the ash from hills. These two are desert hills, spill to the road, where we do not speak of poetry, a bridge to built to burn itself, not unlike a mind. What would open fire mean having opened every fire, boundless open every lung and stoking fire? I do not know what else there is at times, narrative, material split from raw material or preserving the split only to talk on the mezzanine later of men, the wood we live and place ourselves under a star fire and sayable possible in line to say this was our desire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joss. Um, the, just, uh, I obviously I loved the two notes on form and um, that, that sonnet sequence is so beautiful. I, I would love to read the rest. <laughs> um, next up is Jordan. Uh, Jordan Jace is a writer based in Los Angeles and will begin their MFA at Brown University in the fall of 2020. A student of abolitionism, their work has been published with Freedom Arts Press Cosmonauts Avenue and the Poetry Project's yearly publication, The, Rec the Recluse. They have work forthcoming with Smoke and Mold in September and 
we are lucky enough to have them as part of this issue. Uh, welcome, Jordan. Thank you. Uh, um, everyone, or can you hear me? Cool, amazing. Um, yeah, just thanks to everyone who's here. Um, I love my friends so much. Those of you watching, uh, thank you to everyone who's reading. I'm definitely an indebtedness to certain friends I've been just thinking and reading and being with a lot in the quarantine. Um, and thank you, Joss, for those wonderful poems. The first poem, which is the one from the issue, um, is also a grief. Sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna get sad before I read it. Is also a grief poem. Um, the name of that person, I guess I'll keep to myself, but I love them and uh, I hope they're here with us right now. Um, so the poem is called The Storm Took It With It The Wind. It doesn't matter what comes first. Cars file down the road, red van, blue. He sang in the kitchen, in the car, out of every tune, the mountain in the morning, fog burning away. Augustine said places should be loved for the good things that emanate from them. I loved the hateful smell of your nail varnish, playing cards and fume, your son and I cheating, sending signs across the table, all of us joining hands, entering through the back door of a prayer. I imagine you asleep, the fire behind you a dream, on its foundation of shadow, a beloved touches your face, unlike a flower petal unlike a blade of grass. Does he think of you, of your form flickering in and next to fire, fading into a second shadow? Language rounds the edges, no one's home. Next door, the lattice, a veil, red against the wall. The Greeks have a myth for a mother and her grief. But to lose Demeter from a distant country, looking towards you through the open fence of night, my brother's crying as I held someone else's hand. I've slept through wildfires, miles away, earthquakes that shook my bed, a picture falling from the wall, the thunderstorm that kept my mother up all night. Where were you then? Where were they? Quiet sky, no plane, no lodestar, a darkness like the shadow of a map. But now, oh, when there was no ground in the night but our sharp breathing, when I could hear the whole house, who was up and who was dreaming, my fear kept me awake to what rose from dark into dark, footsteps echoing down the hall, stars opening the night, the rusted bars in my window warped, accreting, sh accreting shadows. This Difficult to move for anyone is named Anchor. I remember the candle you brought to my bedside after the social workers had gone. I would never have believed my father had loved me had you not said it. You loved him and didn't know that he could kill you. He's just hurt, he said. All I can hear now is the ocean calling, saying don't leave when it's too late for me to collect either of your hands and mine to stitch abandonment. Why keep turning away? toward where the salt comes to feed. You are what interrupts the water, braid of light, ride on what horse. The years pass you, pass through you. How is it I've come so far and I'm still unable to grieve? The poem would begin here, but with what tongue? All right. Um, I'm gonna read some things I've been working on in the last few months. Um, I don't know how I feel anymore about the thought of like a, a finished poem um, or that like I'll ever finish one in the rest of my life or that the things I'm writing are poems rather than some other genre. Um, that's all fancy talk. Um, but yeah, these are, these are, these are newer um, and coming a lot from certain readings. So this draft is, I have dreams of living at our old house. Panning over a screen, there are YouTube videos of cuts from a reality TV show. I'm reading in a back room, Savoy does homework. My father's voice hovers over the images. 
hovers over the images he is describing us. The news is that I long for an archive, a foreclosure, physical and psychical, from which a substratum could form, from which a layer could ossify and later be abandoned. Instead, it lives with me. I circle melancholy, melancholy circles the sea, the past circles in the center of the concentric past and present merge and harden in my dreams, my blood, my muscle, my cells, like sedimentary rock, sediments detritus of the being. Any treatise on time is already political. I ask my grandma how my cousin who I've never met is doing and she asks me, didn't you know he died last year? She says he lived with her and she loved him very much. To foreclose the foreclosure of the line, to know my grandmother was foreclosed on because I searched and paid for her information on white pages, to be reminded in my email every so often, one person you monitor had an address update. So I know she was foreclosed on or evicted and all but one of the black men that are in her life, in her life an extrapolation, demarcation from whatever state, public and private resources are available to white pages. All these men are marked by red triangles with exclamation marks in them. It indicates a fee or a detention or an arrest. Interestingly, there is no icon for the deceased. Criminalization being a phenomena of the living is immortal. The monitoring goes beyond the false horizons of death and the body tracked until the traces made by the tracking of the body take its place. Of course, they live in her mind and her memory and her mind and memory resist this without knowing it happens. She goes about her day, texts me my younger brother's address, those who have not reached out to in 12 years for reasons I don't really know, and in any case are inexcusable, asks for my address and my birthday. Sometimes she's so brief in her texts, I wonder if secretly she hates me. But the brevity has always been writing, even when she sent me birthday letters in college I never responded to. I realized one day in a pandemic she might be dead and sat up in the middle of a sea. I emerged on the keyboard, I tracked her. I couldn't find a metaphor to merge the keyboard to geologic process, cloud formation, deciding immediately and without thought it couldn't be called an anchor. I don't know what motion the Google search allowed me or how love deferred within certain confines can have surveillance as its conduit for fulfillment only under these matrices, alphabetic continuum of plantation, prison, privatization, etc. It is so hard to find an ending. Longing resists it, the poem resists it. Conclusion is a symptom of all historic violences, is symptomatic. A poet said something about longing stretching you. From here in Rhode Island, with the moon as its shadow stretches to my brothers. This means as little as tapping interested on a Facebook event page for a demonstration. I should call. I should write. I should call. Uh, gonna stay on a note of sentimental or longing poems, <laughs> um, but was also really loving in Joss's work, thoughts about futurity um, and the world to come since we're in a moment of uprising, although that's just like a continuation of a really long tradition um, that is like constitutive and equally as long as traditions of colonization. But um, this one's just called Writing April 3rd. If memory is a mutiny, an instant across time, across bodies that takes place in a cell, if memory is a mutiny, if my fear of my Fathers are only not, I will tighten it and pull, towing myself towards him, towards myself, edging into place, hoping to release, hoping my heart moves radially, hoping he sees he is within it, even through our language of silence and of leaving, as though the distance itself caused us to take such similar shapes. You are always related to the prisoner. I don't know what freedom looks like. I don't think of it as an exterior, a landscape. I do think it is a land, but not an arrival. My imagination has been deplumed. The last poem I wrote before the last time we saw each other, I imagined your nephew in his cell, thinking about his daughter. 
The cell wall is a lease and a lens activated by your black body that also works in reverse. You are not born only towards punishment. I'm sorry your father never kissed you, and I'm thankful for the times you kissed me on the forehead, <laughs> planting stars. In the painting, the colonial context, I'm the painting, with the settled colonial context. Me and my dad, a triptych, the middle frame busted through. On one side, New Jersey, the other, a shadow, the Atlantic, the plantation, daughters, violations of laws, falsely worn like hazmat suits, handled as bull whip, snake whip, signal whip, stock whip. Today, I walk through a neighborhood filled with people, my white mother's neighborhood, well assume, don't understand. Tomorrow, already here, even if not given, we can make a set of demands, a time strike. There will be no tomorrow until we are all free, which will be a moment of love and infinite questioning. What, what have, what will, what be? Uh, that is, I guess I'm just realizing how much all of this is indebted to a dear friend of mine named Cali, um, who has taught me everything about time and that time is not linear. Um, the always already of the world. So I'll just read one last little poem thinking about, I suppose the same things I'm thinking about all the time, whether I'm just writing or talking shit. Uh, draft, uh, black and other antibodies. My relationship with my father has become imaginary. Time in the state who authors time has worn it down. I hope to help people without pathologizing them. I'm starting to feel like the self-awareness of the poem as a gesture is bourgeois. If the poem is in the street in any of its valences, why, how, and to who does it need to identify itself? What is the accountable space? Under certain assumptions, none of you who are reading this know what I smell like. This is potentially dangerous. We are in the process of shifting from one accountability to another, from catalog to sift and split, the logs in the mind, slave tracks, tactics, tracks, burn the deeds and the holdings, then move forward. Accountability intact through holding to what? Without sail or anchor in between the two points, holding pattern, space, X is the imagine of the precocious future colony. Colony as a tension between land and abstraction, intersect, interstice, sirens blaring, cutting through the Zoom call, punctuation, invasion, forgetting as a hope process of oppression. A film is a coating, a coat, a material need, a developed material, shoved through light into image, a thin coating or coating, an exceedingly thin layer, so thin, perhaps, as to be confused with what is beneath it, to cover with, or as if with a film, to become covered or obscured, or as if with a film, smoke, Tulsa, cigarettes, the proximity of exceedingness within its, within its temporal arrangement as telos or obit, self approximately equal to approach danger. Um, thank you guys so much, and I really can't wait to hear everyone else's work. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, those all, I feel like <laughs> all of them made me rethink things that I thought were assumptions. Um, they were also just beautiful. <clears throat> um, thank you. And I, I'm so glad you led with that, uh, that poem from our issue, which I've read so many times. <laughs> um, it's just, I'm, I, I just love it. <laughs> uh, next up is Yaley Kamara. Yaley Kamara is a Sierra Leonean American writer, researcher, and a native of Oakland, California. She's the author of a brief biography of my name, which was included in New Generation African Poetics, a chapbook box set from Tano, um, from, African Poetry, from the African Poetry Book series at Akashic Books in 2018. Uh, and also uh, is the author of When the Living Sing um, from Ledge Mule Press in 2017. She has received fellowships from the Vermont Studio Center, Kalaloo, and the National Book Critics Circle, 
and was a finalist for the Brunel African Poetry Prize. She earned an MFA in creative writing from Indiana University Bloomington and is currently a doctoral student in creative writing and English literature at the University of Cincinnati. Welcome, Yaley. Hello. Oh, hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Excellent. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Adroit for inviting me to be part of such a wonderful and special reading. And I'm really excited and happy to be reading alongside um, such amazing writers. Um, I want to thank everybody that came out on a Thursday night or came to their living room or wherever you guys are at. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to you know see Blood and Chosen family here and, and hopefully have some new friends by the end of this. And so yeah, just a lot of thanks. Um, I'm going to read three poems, and I like to kind of read in themes, and I think I'm just going to read about some of the women in my life. And so um, the first poem I'm going to read is about a woman. Um, I did a, a workshop with Kalalu a few years ago in Barbados, um, and I met a, an amazing woman named Margaret Gill, who's a poet, and she told me that in Barbados, um, Black people can see the rainbow on their skin. And so this is my experience looking for that um, uh, and so the poem is called Souvenir. Um, do this, Miss Margaret calls out to me, and so I leave her air-conditioned office, then follow. We stand here under the hot fist of this Bayesian sky. Each of our right arms is extended. She rotates her wrist, then I swivel mine. Our bracelets clang against the wind, against the shack shack tree's gentle drumming, against the barren parking lot's cratered face upon which we plant our feet. We begin to melt from woman to solid to liquid. From the main office window, it must look like we are dancing, though if our shadows told the story, it would say that our limbs are trying to twist the world like a wind-up toy. She points to the first sweat beads that congregate at the shore of my forearm like a handful of cabochons. They burst into prismatic rivulets. Miss Margaret watches my summer flesh alchemized. She is wide grinned as I learned the secret, how in this season we become black opal under each other's watchful eye. A week later, I smuggle myself through customs. In America, I try it again and again. The magic trick in which I make a rainbow of my skin every time it storms in this nation that I call home. The next poem I'm going to read, um, I feel like I need to share with you guys. JC said that your, your smell is a mystery. My smell is rose jam from Lush. Um, I wear perfume around the house because, I mean, what else is there to do during a quarantine? So I um, just wanted you guys to know me a little bit more. The next poem I'm going to read is called American Beach, and um, it's referring to American Beach Tree, a leaf um, from that tree. And it's about an encounter with a stranger um, that I had in an account I had in Bloomington that made me feel um, a little less homesick. American Beach. I don't mind when she approaches me, a stranger on North Walnut Street who only tells me about what she sees while reaching two fingers in to retrieve it from my hair. She squints a bit, fights the menace of hot silver Hoosier sun, and relieves me of a problem that for her rests too close to me. A deep plunge into my curls, I wait to see how far she goes, and because I miss the hands of the women I know, I think I'd even let her hook her unfamiliar fingers into the net and lace of my wig, but she stops short of me feeling completely like home. It is an American beech leaf, green as green, as opposite of red. She pulls this weightless raft from the inside of the crown of me. In small town downtown, there is a woman who does not know my name, but calls herself my shadow, haptic grace. She holds the leaf to my face, then releases it to flow slowly down the vertical river of air to the pewter concrete. I don't mind when she approaches me, a stranger on North Walnut Street, taking a leaf, leaving her fingerprints to sing and sing and sing so close to our skin until I hear my own voice say, I feel you too. How mighty the God portal of human touch. And the last poem I'm going to read is Bisedu, which I'm really, really happy is part of issue number 34 of the Adroit Journal. 
And um, yeah, I'm not gonna explain it. You guys can just listen. Oh, also I wanted to dedicate all the poems that I'm reading tonight to my little sister who's somewhere out in the digital audience. Um, yeah, so this poem, it's, this poem's actually not about her, it's about my, me and my mom. But in any case, this goes out to my little sister. Be say do. While sipping coffee in my mother's Toyota, we hear the bird call of two teenage boys in the parking lot. I, one says, be say do, the other returns as they reach for each other. Their cupped handshake pops like the first fat firecrackers of summer. Their fingers shimmy as if they're solving a Rubik's cube just beyond our sight. Moments later, their schwins head in opposite directions. My mother turns to me, revealing the milky John Waters mustache thin foam on her upper lip. Wait and then be say, be say do. Not English, she asks, tickled by this tangle of new language. All right, be safe, dude. I pull apart each syllable like string cheese for her. Oh yeah, dem na real padi, she smiles, surprisingly broken by the tenderness expressed by what half my family might call thugs. Be say do, be say do, be say do. We chirp in the car, then nightly into our phones after I leave California. Be say do, she says as she softly muffles the rattling of my bones in newfound sobriety. Be say do, I say years later, her response made raspy by an oxygen treatment at the ER. Be say do, we, we whisper to each other across the country, like some word from deep in a somewhere, too newborn pure for the outdoors. But we saw those two boys do it in broad daylight under a decadent, ruinous sun. Thank you. Beautiful poem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yaley. I agree. <laughs> it's a beautiful poem. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, we are taking a reroute to fiction <laughs> um, and uh, in prose more broadly. And uh, so I, I'm really excited to introduce uh, David Naiman. So David Naiman's work has appeared or is forthcoming in Orion, Tin House, Boulevard, Agony, Black Warrior Review, and elsewhere. It has garnered a Pushcart Prize, been reprinted in the Best Small Fictions, and cited in Best American Essays and Best American Travel Writing. He is the co-author with Ursula K. Le Guin of Ursula K. Le Guin, Conversations on Writing, which won the 2019 Locus Award in Nonfiction and was a Hugo Award finalist. He lives in Portland, where he hosts the literary radio broadcast and podcast Between the Covers. Please join me in welcoming uh, David. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes, OK. Um, thank you, Adroit Journal. It's an honor to. Um, be reading with my fellow contributors and people who are some of my favorite contemporary poets. Uh, um, as Peter said, I have a story which is a short story, but it's too long to read for this 10 minutes installment. So I cobbled together uh, excerpts as sort of a literary version of a movie trailer that um, will hopefully, hopefully give you an idea of what it would be like if you were to decide to read the whole story. So this is the teaser for my story, The Blind Experiment. It was on a day just like this, reading his wife's bewildering, bewildering checklist for their twin sons on one of Linus's first days as a house husband that he thought of the experiment. As he watched the bus recede with both his twins remarkably successfully on it, Linus felt relieved if not victorious. They were clothed and fed and headed to school, but his head still spun from this sudden reversal of fortune. Just two weeks ago, he had been a professor, up for tenure, giving his most anticipated talk, his beloved butterfly lecture at the beginning of Endocrinology 301, and here he was a mere fortnight later, dismissed, alone in his kitchen, at the end of his cul-de-sac, geographically and spiritually, and unsure how to navigate the day before him. He knew he had all day to clean up the morning's mess before Elspeth returned from work, but where to begin? He began by surveying the scene, the broken glass, 
the spilt milk purling at the edge of the table. Topher's, or was it Crispin's, brown bristled toothbrush by the coffee grinder, a milk tooth left on the lip of the sink for the tooth fairy. And Linus reminded himself that this, family life, was really no different than the endocrine system, an infinitely complex network of positive and negative feedback loops of ever-moving parts whose individual components, glands, family members, could not be understood, abstracted from the soup of regulatory substances they bathed themselves in, a soup of self and other, of moves and responses meant to support or counter one thing or another. Understanding it required not reduction or simplification, but the embracing of bewilderment, he thought, an awe-filled witnessing of creation's complexity as he sponged the glass shards, uneaten, uneaten bread crusts, and milk onto the floor into an addressable of ill-defined pile. It was Linus who had suggested getting rid of Gertie, the nanny. They'd always been a two-income household, but until Linus could figure out his next move, they would get by solely on Elspeth's work as a dietitian. It seemed extravagant to keep Gertie on. Nevertheless, Linus missed her, the linearity of her efforts, the pure physics of her actions, the ways in which each exertion seemed to produce a predictable and desired result. He found himself mimicking her as he swept the floor, rinsed the errant coffee grinds from the unused toothbrush, loaded the dishwasher. Just because the system was complex and ever shifting didn't mean there weren't lesser or greater degrees of balance. Elspeth had only half joked that he couldn't tell his own sons apart. The unspoken subtext being that he should be able to tell them apart at all times. But they were identical twins after all, motored by the same genetic machinery, nurtured by the same mother, nanny, and teachers. And Elspeth had the inane habit to dress them the same, surely just to irk him even more. Of course he could tell them apart many, many times. He'd say Topher, and one of their heads would snap back, not the other, things like that. He knew they would differentiate as they aged, but how different were any two seven-year-olds in the big picture? There was an irony here that this whole idea, his whole idea of wholeness, of balance, of a holistic systems approach to science was the very thing that got him in trouble. He'd been giving the butterfly lecture for years without anything but glowing student reviews. He'd invited Werner Moto, the naturopathic healer, to guest lecture many times before, and it had never been the slightest bit controversial, just productive and thought-provoking. His colleagues, if they thought Linus were perhaps a little eccentric in his ways, admired how he engaged the students in the topic at hand, namely, treatment philosophies in thyroid pathophysiology. Linus replaced the toothbrush next to its equally unused cousin in the boy's bathroom and confronted himself in the mirror over the sink. He touched his neck just above and between the medial ends of his clavicles, the fingers of his left and right hands alighting upon the symmetrical and smooth left and right lobes of his thyroid respectively. He shimmied the two wings of this butterfly-shaped gland back and forth beneath his fingers, looked deep into his haggard, unshaven face, and said, this is not physics. This is not the land of cause and effect, of input and output, of abstraction and purity of form. By signing up for this course, you have entered the wilderness. Your traveling companions are complexity and relativity, mystery and irreducibility, much like chaos theory, small alterations, the proverbial flapping of a butterfly's wings can give rise to great and striking consequences in seemingly unrelated parts of the organism. He would pause here, as he did now for his reflected audience of one, to linger in and thus augment the spell, spell he was weaving. He'd survey the lecture hall in the pregnant silence, knowing right away which students he had hooked by his introductory words. They had the same slack-jawed, shocked-awake gleam in their eye that he himself had, listening to the words he'd said countless times before, 
ones that still produced an electric thrill in him even now. It was an entirely different sort of feeling he felt then, entirely different than when he sat across from his wife at the kitchen table each night since his life went off the rails. Each day, without fail, he made sure the kitchen was returned to order. No teeth on the lip of the sink, toothbrushes face down by the coffee grinder, milk weeping off the edge of the table, that the boys were in their room with homework splayed before them, that he tucked his t-shirt into the eroded elastic band of his sweatpants and wet down that stubborn tuft of hair at the posterior edge of his ever-widening bald spot before Elspeth returned from a productive day in the world out there. Nevertheless, their nightly review of their respective days always ended up feeling like an interrogation, even as he admitted to himself that this feeling of being examined may have been entirely self-generated, entirely a product of the shame of his, diminished, of his diminished station. His sons rumbled down the stairs, perched on their chairs, and side by side started flipping open the takeout containers Elspeth had brought home from walk and go. Linus wanted to scream or break something or all sorts of things or storm out with a house-shaking slam of the door, something dramatic, but the tides of habit swept him to his chair. And it was there in this habitual position as he stared across the table at the orange glazed faces of his two heirs nibbling with an equal lack of grace on their glistening and gooey sweet and sour pork pieces that he realized that amidst this swirling mess of unasked for chaos and shame he was blessed with one inimitable constant one fixed integer one axial reference point one rare thing that any scientist would consider themselves duly blessed to have the identical double helixes of his two sons, two perfectly duplicated spiral ladders of genetic code, the absolute perfect test subjects. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> it's, I, I feel like this was the perfect time to have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of prose in there. So I'm super excited. Um, I'm super excited that you have introduced us to this story and I hope everybody, well, I hope everybody after this reading will go read the whole issue, but uh, I hope that everyone will go read your story. Um, we certainly obviously loved it. So uh, thank you. Next up is Amy Nezuka Maratil. Um, Amy is the author of four books of poetry, Oceanic, Lucky Fish, winner of the Hoffer Grand Prize for Prose and Independent Books, uh, at the Drive-In Volcano and Miracle Fruit. With Ross Gay, she co-authored Lace and Pyrite, a chapbook of nature poems uh, released from Organic Weapon Arts. Her most recent publication is the highly anticipated World of Wonders, her first book of essays. She is po the poetry editor of Orion Magazine, and her poems have appeared in the Best American Poetry Series, American Poetry Review, New England Review, Poetry, Plowshares, and Tin House. Awards for her writing include an NEA Fellowship in Poetry and the Pushcart Prize. She is Professor of English and Creative Writing in the MFA program at the University of Mississippi and uh, a contributor to the 34th issue of the Adroit Journal. <laughs> so uh, please join me in welcoming Amy. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and I am so excited. I was telling you before we logged on that um, I, th I think this is going to be new. You guys are on the forefront of um, bringing in um, 200 people on a, two, on a Thursday night, you know, for a literary journal. So congrats to, to the whole adroit stuff. I'm going to read an excerpt from my essay here. And I just got this in the mail um, a couple days ago. It's the actual hardcover of my uh, book, World of Wonders. And um, that's where this essay is coming from and it's called Flamingo and the Latin name for a flamingo is Phenocopterus ruber. A flamingo returns to a soda lake for food and to dance. The dance is legs akimbo, spindle stick and joint backward steps from all you know. In hot temperatures a thick crust of salt is left to bake in the heat. Perfect sodium rich mud to form rock hard towers about two feet tall for nesting its singular egg. 
Flamingos gather around lakes where few fish can live so they don't have to compete with anything that eats their favorite food, algae. My freshman year in college, 17 and still stretching, my legs outgrew my torso and I shopped for jeans in the men's sections of the thrift stores my friends and I rummaged through after class. Tiny waist and no hips. I didn't yet know this body could break into salt. Boys in the late 20s could cruise us over at UDF, United Dairy Farmers, Hammond Western, the convenience store closest to the freshman honors dorm. My girlfriends and I bought ice cream during study breaks, each of us with only a dollar to our names, and we could scrounge up enough to buy a pint to split if we gave a few extra giggles and smiles and promises of parties where we'd be sure to show up later to the checkout guy. But of course, these parties were fiction. To find a monogamous mate to build their egging structure, a flamingo locks step and step with other flamingos, head flagging with stretches from their mighty necks and snapping their beaks to the left and then to the right as they march in unison. The ones who move the most succeed in finding mates in a, da in a dance of mimicry and rhythm that is just marvelous especially in gatherings of upward of several hundred thousand birds. It's a search for the right partner who wants to step together through one of the longest bird lives on the planet, about 50 or so years. We sometimes danced with these older men at clubs and I confess, I was flattered by all the attention lavished on my brown body after years in junior high and high school, being largely ignored by boys those years with my pink plastic eyeglasses and nose always in a book. Since I was 12, my skinny legs stretching through the night kept me up and sometimes crying as I stumbled into my parents' bedroom, moonlight falling over their bodies. One of them always woke for me, shuffled down the stairs to boil water for a hot water bottle and massaged my legs until the cries stopped and I fell asleep with the heat tenderizing my calves. Tylenol never helped. You're growing, you're growing, that's all, they reassured me the next day. Your legs will be so long and that's good, very good. When flamingos sleep, they tuck one leg under their feathers, alternating with the other leg to regulate body heat and to keep one leg warm at all times. What we think of as a flamingo knee is actually its ankle. A flamingo's actual knee isn't visible through its belly's feathers. I hate to say it looks like marching because that seems to mean war or violence these days as in a recent case out of Florida. A flamingo named Pinky at Tampa's Bush Gardens was so beloved, she was named the zoo mascot. Pinky became one of the most visited animals in the zoo, with children especially wanting to see this famous bird featured on so many souvenirs inside the zoo's gift shops, until one of the most gruesome zoo attacks in Florida history. People at the zoo that fateful day noticed a 45-year-old man acting somewhat erratic, pacing back and forth, but none could ever figure out why he reached over grabbed Pinky by the neck in front of dozens of children watching and hoisted the five pound bird over his head, throwing Pinky with such brute force to the hot cement. Her foot was nearly severed from the trauma. The veterans wept as they euthanized her the next day. My girlfriends and I would hit the college bars for dancing, never drinking anything more than water, and we always walked home in groups or at least pairs. We'd study through the day and maybe take a disco nap to help us stay out late. At around nine in the evening, we'd start getting ready and we'd walk to bars with barely any ID checks, boys in, in arms, sorry, wearing boy jeans and chunky black shoes, a mess of choker necklaces and thin straps of leather bracelets. We'd hear stories, though, of a girl who never made it home. I thought that was just the 90s. Before cell phones to check in and call for backup of your friends or to call the police with a few buttons. But 25 years later, 
Another story from my alma mater of a young woman missing. Someone last saw her at a quarter to 10 before the bars even mop up and close up. We were like flamingos flying long distance, mostly, mostly, mostly at night. So many kidnappings happen in the dark when we think we are safe in a routine, in a place where so-called bad things like that just don't happen. When a flamingo flies in daylight, it does look comical. It's long legs dragging down under the fluff of feathered torso. Someone called the police to say they found her body next day at a local park. 25 years after my girlfriends and I made dancing from Wednesday to Saturday nights part of our freshman year routine, I'm now a professor at a big state university. If I'm, if I'm outside late at night, it's usually to pick up something for a late night craft project of one of my kids. I still look over my shoulder in a dark parking lot. I text my husband to let him know I'm in the car and headed home. Someone said she was due to graduate in less than three months. I see young coeds lining the sidewalks near their campus on their way to dance and dance and dance even in the middle of the week as I once did. So I say a silent prayer for them to all come back safe to their nests late at night again and again. So far, every one of them has come home. And when I see groups of young women out together, I can't help but silently offer something like a prayer for them. Tonight, let them tuck their legs under safe covers, let their parents breathe steady in their own bedrooms and receive no panicked late night phone calls. Under a brilliant moon and unbeknownst to us, the darkened world shimmers and silvers from pink and ebony wings, a small thunder. We can't possibly hear an astonishing wind while we try to keep in step in step with our small dances on this earth, but we should try. We should try. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, and I hope uh, just to reiterate um, that essay is from uh, World of Wonder, World of Wonders, sorry, um, from Milkweed Editions. And uh, everyone should get their copy. <laughs> um, and speaking of uh, books out, our next reader, Alicia Ostriker, also has a book uh, coming right around the bend. And uh, I read it. And as soon as I read it, I I just had to sit down and say, wow. Um, so look out for that one, too. Um, Alicia Ostriker has published 16 volumes of poetry, including Waiting for the Light, The Old Woman, The Tulip, and The Dog, The Book of Life, Selected Jewish Poems, 1979 to 2011, No Heaven, The Volcano Sequence, and The Imaginary Lover, winner of the William Carlos Williams Award. She was twice a National Book Award finalist for The Little Space in 1998 and The Crack in Everything in 1996, and twice a National Jewish Book Award winner. Her poetry has appeared in The New Yorker, American Poetry Review, The Atlantic, Paris Review, Yale Review, Ontario Review, The Nation, The New Republic, Best American Poetry, The Pushcart Prize Anthology, and many other journals and anthologies, and has been translated into numerous languages, including Hebrew and Arabic. Ostriker's critical work now includes the now classic Stealing the Language, The Emergence of Women's Poetry in America, and other books on American poetry and on the Bible. Please welcome Alicia Ostriker. Alicia, you're- uh... I, I am now unmuted, right? Perfect, yes, you are. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, everyone, you wonderful writers. It is very thrilling to be here and fun. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of poems from this book, which Peter just mentioned, which will be coming out in September. Uh, the Volcano and After, it's a selected and new. And these are from the new section. 
the death of the swan and other questions. After many a summer does the swan die? Yes, after many a summer the swan does die. Left alone, would people hate each other and make war? My mother said they would not. Lapel needs straightening. Leave me alone, will you? I will never leave you alone. Yesterday seems so far away, doesn't it? Yes, and it will never return, not until time swallows her yellow tail. Old Man River, do you trust him to flow forever? I do, deeply. Unlike the turnpike traffic on Friday night, the turnpike traffic cannot flow forever. Ultimately, it will rust. Nothing really touches you, does it? I don't have to answer that question. Everything frightens you? If you say that again, I'll punch you in the mouth. Even your own son running hopefully toward you? You have heard of the sins of the fathers. Do you not wish you knew how to love me? I wish scrambled eggs and a side of bacon. Nevertheless, I move. Can you move on? On and off, I can, I can, and I will, bye. Is it true that we can only be hurt by those we love? No, it is not true, not true at all. Um, so I, I have fun writing poems full of questions to which there are no answers. Um, this one is also from that book and I realized afterward, and it's, it's too late to, to say this in the book, that this poem is a kind of footnote to Muriel Rukeyser's poem, Islands. Does anybody know that poem? Um, uh, yeah. Rukeyser's poem, Islands. Uh, it's three, three little lines, which are kind of mantra for me. Um, oh, for God's sake, they are connected underneath. Um, and you'll, you'll see why this poem, this little poem is important to me. Uh, this is called The Words When I Wrote Them. When she was two and made to hike with the rest of us, our younger daughter toddled on her fat little legs across the soft beach singing, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. I still remember that, and she has spent a lifetime learning what she does not know, because she is a scientist. But all of us are seekers in our way, all of us still learning what to think of ourselves and the world. When HD was an old lady like me, a voice commanded her, write, write, or die. The words when I wrote them were oddly familiar, ocean floor exoskeletal creatures, glossy, lumpy, waving tails or waving tentacles. To me, was full and good down there, but I don't know. I only collected them, hoisted them from deep to daylight, nearly drowning, and here I am, gasping, pulling off my mask, breathing. Um, 
So I get the words from the ocean floor. Um, and I'll read one other poem, and this is from the book just before this one. It's called Waiting for the Light, and it looks like that. Oh. And it's called The Liberal Arts. And it's a definition of everything. The liberal arts. In mathematics, they say the most beautiful solution is the correct one. In physics, they say everything that can happen must happen. In history, they say the more it changes, the more it is the same. In astrophysics, you take the long view. In chemistry, you explode and blend. It is a bit like freestyle cooking. The Yiddish term would be yupachki. In biology, you smell the flowers, the enticing flowers, and you play with mice, and you write grant proposals. studies, they say, everybody come along, be ironic now. Business school, we systematize the competitive strategies we learned in the sandbox. Engineering moves us firmly into manhood. We grip the material world in our fists. Computer science assists us toward the goal of replacing our species with a new, improved, more efficient form of life based in, a, in electronics instead of carbon. Many of us are rushing to transform ourselves as quickly as possible. Religion is still hot. People keep plunging passionately into and out of it at the usual brisk rate. Geography suggests the future dominance of North America by Spanish-speaking people, but it does not say when. Geology looks stony, takes the long view. Music bridges mathematics, the soul of the universe, and my personal soul. Visual art is the bridge between my bag of body and bones and stuff in the painterly universe. Drama crosses this bridge on foot. In the novel they say, omit nothing, harvest the entire goddamn world. In memoir they say, the self is silently weeping, give it a tissue. In poetry, they say, the arrow may be blown off course by storm and returned by miracle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, and just to, uh, to reemphasize, <laughs> um, The Volcano and After is uh, Alicia's new book of poetry. It's a selected and new, and it's coming out from Pitt Poetry in, in uh, September. So if you enjoyed that, you should pick up a copy. <laughs> um, now uh, we have reached that point. Uh, it is the last reading, um, and I am all but certain it will be a pretty darn good one. <laughs> um, uh, I am thrilled to welcome <laughs> Diane Seuss. Uh, Diane Seuss's most recent collection, Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl from Grey Wolf Press in 2018, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Four-Legged Girl uh, from Grey Wolf Press in 2015 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Frank Sonnets is forthcoming from Grey Wolf in 2021. She is a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow. Uh, Seuss was raised by a single mother in rural Michigan, where, which she continues to call home. Welcome, Diane. Hey, can you hear me, everybody? Yep. Yep. Okay, here I go to the poems. Um, thank you to Peter and Heidi and everybody at Adroit and to the readers. I'm 
so honored to uh, follow you all and to hear you, some of you, for the first time. Um, so the two uh, sonnets that are in the Adroit are both sort of set in New York. And so um, I decided to go with that setting for, for these poems tonight. Um, also because Peter is going to be, or is, uh, in New York. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'll dedicate this to you, Peter. I should have been in cinema. I should have been in paint or founded a band. I'm certain of nothing, said the tattoo. Where is home, scratched the chickens. I should have met the stones when I had the chance. Should have let Keith turn me inside out. So what if I ended up dead or crazy? I am big, but this feeling is the silo whispered. I am a movie screen, drawled the pasture. I should have kept the baby. So what poverty? I could have loved the little fox-faced punk. I am buxom, breathed the prairie. I should have taken the radical path. I should have gone the cheerleader's way. Should have married Chuck before he enlisted. What if I'm a star, said the lamb. A star, said the ham. A star, said the duck. A star, said the truck. A star, said the star. Is this music about sound and not notes? What if it broadcasts a shimmering? And this is the second one that's in the mag. Parties among strangers. Punks, leather caps and straps, pressing quaaludes between my lips. What was pressed in, I swallowed. Is it hard for you to imagine me wearing gold lipstick? I did. Is it hard for you to imagine me stupid? I was passed like bread among strangers. For a couple of nights, I was the new thing. Then, just a thing. Days, I ran a vintage clothing store, sat at a card table with a cigar box for a cash drawer, the place too small for more than a couple of racks of old dresses and tuxedos. Every day, a screenwriter newly arrived from Poland sat across from me, knee to knee, and read from his horrible screenplay. He asked for critique, but when I gave it, he derided me, once even spit in my face. I quit the job to get away from him, or didn't quit, just didn't show up one day. That's how things worked back then. I was valueless, no? It seems strange now when everyone is so intent on having value. I flirted, excuse me, <laughs> I did that too. I flitted in my stolen vintage clothes, topless. I was that writer named Anonymous. My first night in New York, I'm such a beautiful dick. My soul circumcised, no shielding foreskin, wearing some sort of leotard thing and gold fabric safety pinned around my waist as a skirt. I pierced one of my ears with a darning needle, ice cube to numb it, to hurt the only verb I knew. Stabbed through that ear hole a gold safety pin, the kind girls back then wore on plaid skirts. And Kev that first night, his robe in evil green, his unacceptable glamorous nose, eye holes as if precisely cut from his face with a utility knife 
to exhibit the dangerous spectacle at play inside his skull. Roland I cannot get over having had this good fortune to meet what matches my desire. And I would add, he who would slaughter me. Do I have time for one more? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Sorry. All right. Yes, I saw them all, saw them, met some. Richard Hell, Lou Reed, Basquiat, Warhol, Burroughs, Kenneth Koch. And it all left me feeling invisible or fucked. Fucked sideways, fucked by a John who stiffs you on your feet and doesn't tip. It wasn't impressive. It wasn't literary. It wasn't titillating. I hope you are not titillated by it. Their loathing of women was indisputable, sometimes leaving genuine bruises, more often just a sneer or no eye contact. The eyes wandering off like dogs looking for something worth peeing on. Or rarely but potently, and maybe worst of all, something involving the word beautiful, weaponizing the word beautiful. Finally, I took a turn and made myself appalling, like drag queens. I did not want to be acceptable. I wanted to be alarming. Hulk, Colossus, Freak. Maybe not a great life plan, but a step in the right direction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. What a wonderful place to arrive at the end of this reading. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I have a couple of little ending notes, but first I would really love it. it if we could all unmute and just give a round of applause to our amazing readers tonight. Um, I think they deserve it or <laughs> um, they, they've just been so, so wonderful, all of them. So I, please unmute and, uh, and, and feel free to applaud. <laughs> Great. Um, so, a couple mm -hmm. of a uh, couple of closing things, just really quickly. Number one, um, thank you again to everybody who um, who read, who showed up, who read our issue, um, who shared the issue, who helped us select pieces. Um, all of you on staff, uh, it's just been it, this issue and, and really all issues have are such a gift um, to put together, and um, and I'm. You know the fact that people enjoy reading them and and sharing them is even more uh, even more appreciated. <laughs> so uh, so that's the first thing. And then I did also just want to say uh, we are open to submissions. Um, we are reading for October and January right now, um, and we would love to see what you all have. Um, so we're we don't have a submission fee. We're completely open free submissions. Um, so I, I hope that uh, some or many of you will take us up on that. So uh, to, uh, to submit, feel free to just go to theadroitjournal.org and uh, you can click on submit in the nav bar. So, uh, so with that, I know it's, it's uh, 923 here in Connecticut, uh, which means that the uh, Democratic National Convention is on the final night of it. So uh, I will just encourage everybody here, please vote. Um, no matter what you believe, um, democracy is, is a, a, a cornerstone of this country. Um, and so I'm just really, uh, and I know that we have a lot of, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds that follow us. So um, if this is your first time in an election, uh, please don't be intimidated, please go for it. Um, 
vote, vote and express your opinions and your beliefs. Uh, and, uh, and with that, I will, uh, I will go ahead and end this. Um, but thank you so much again to all of you for, uh, for coming out and for sticking around. Thank you.